it's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Podcast, the place to catch up on all the regional and national rugby in Wales. You can find us on all the usual social media platforms and message us through there if you want, or you can email us on Welsh Regional Rugby Pod at gmail.com. So, all the boring stuff out of the way, let's talk rugby. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of the Rap Podcast with me, Lee G, full crew this week, Jamie, James, and Harley. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, uh, James, I had to remember to unmute. Nice one. Yeah, we're, we're off to a flyer. Right. Okay. We've got a ton of stuff to, to get through. To, well, we haven't got a ton of stuff to get through, but we've got some really points. There's a lot of points on one subject we need to get through tonight. So, Let's start with Drink of the Week. So I'm going to kick off this week on Drink of the Week. So I've got a, a, a bottle called uh, Old Crafty Hen, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a, a an oak-aged ale, and it's strong, a 6.5%. I think I'm, I might need it to get through tonight. But the wanky bollocks is we take our legendary six-strong ale, aged gently in oak vats for many months and blended with old speckled hen to create this masterpiece. A perfectly crafted premium ale burst in with malt, toffee and dried fruit. Mm. So that last bit sounds like a chocolate bar you have at Christmas, but it's it's quite nice. I quite like it. Um, yeah, so that's that's my and. I mean, you've missed out that the head has gone on it, but that was a good, you know, for those on on, on, on YouTube... There was a good solid head on there before as well. It was it was a proper proper beer. Right, who 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 wants to go next then? Go on in, Harley. Go on, you can. Go on in. So, uh, continuing my tour of uh, Glamorgan Glamorgan Brewing. So this is um, Kurugoslas, which I've definitely butchered the pronunciation because I don't know how I got a name for GCSE Welsh. So the monkey marks on this is named after the village in Carmarthenshire where it was first brewed. This well-balanced beer, which, the, you know, they put the Welsh word for it, is a love letter to the classic bitters we grew up on, which is proper wanky. Just saying. But this one is actually great because on the ingredients, it goes water, malted barley, wheat, hops. And it tells you what the hops are because I know there are some people who like that sort of thing. And if you are interested, it's Challenger, Goldings, US Cascade. Mm. I have no idea what any of that fucking means. No. But it no. tastes nice. <laughs> but mine's got toffee in. And I have no idea. So I, I think my wanky bollocks outwanks your wanky bollocks. I'll be honest with you, mate. No, you, yeah. you just got special festive wank. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a podcast title. That's, that's something for another time. James, uh, what have you got, mate? Uh, I'm back on to my final can of juice for the, the the popular one. But I would just like to put around the top, like you said, it's brewed in the capital of the north and it's beers with character. So I automatically know whoever brews this, I don't want to be friends with. 
Because if you say your beer is character, then you are the most boring man ever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, what is the capital of the North? Where does the North start? N. There you go. Uh, Jamie, yours. I have got a Welsh craft lager from Axel Jack Brewery, who are based in my steg. There it is. It's 4.5%. And there is some wanky bollocks with this. So I'm struggling to see the font on this. But uh, right. Using a blend of two malted barleys to produce the classic appearance and behavior of lager and added oats for flavor. This craft brew also includes a hop from the Czech Republic, used in the brewing of traditional Central European lagers and pilsners. Clean and crisp on the palate, with forward notes of citrus, grapefruit and lemon, and a lingering sense of aromatic earthiness and subtle spices. Now, that's some wanky bollocks that's right some, there, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Jamie wins wanky bollocks for this week. If there was a wanky bollocks trophy, which there will be at the end of the season, that's that's right up there with the wanky bollocks, that is, mate. That's, it's a nice uh, lager as well, by the way. It's very nice. It's not too crafty tasting, if you see what I mean. It does taste like a proper lager. Because some of these craft lagers have that sort of like elderflower taste to them, don't they? But uh, this is all right, actually. So, uh, yeah, Axel Jack Brewery. Cheers. Cool. Okay. okay. Well, I think we're going to need a decent amount of alcohol to get through tonight, then, gents. So, James, let's uh, Jamie, let's start with them. Um, let's start with the news desk, and uh, and then we'll 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 head on to fantasy league before we get into the iffy stuff. Right, OK, well, let's start with the big news then that happened last week. So George North has now officially retired from international rugby. North announced last week that he's ended a 14-year test career after the wales Italy game on Saturday. And, well, the list of achievements speak for themselves, don't they? So 121 Wales caps, 47 tries, two Grand Slams, two Six Nations titles, two World Cup semi-finals, and two tours with the British and Irish Lions. What a fantastic servant to Welsh rugby. Um, it did come as a little bit of a shock when it was first out, announced, sorry. But then when you think about it, him going over to France, you know, I suppose he wanted that send-off and he didn't want his career to sort of fizzle out in the same way as maybe Thomas Francis's and Ross Moriarty's have done since they moved to Pro D. So he wanted that big send-off and he felt the time was right. But a fantastic servant to Welsh rugby, brilliant player. And I guess a lot of um, rugby fans... Favourite memory of George North, the thing he's most remembered for is, of course, Israel Folau in the Lions test against Australia 2030 when he lifted him up and carried him. It was a fantastic moment. But question for you guys, are there any particular George North moments that stand out for you, either for Wales or a club level in Wales? In, uh, in Wales? Well, Thanks. boy, do I have the podcast for you. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So... Um, <laughs> Because we and Cardiff were the only ones recording last week, we actually um, scrapped the episode that we were we had planned and just ended up doing a a, pod, uh, a tribute to George North. And his time at the Ospreys has been stunted, yes, but he's actually given us some very, very good um, memories. And just sort of that, that mini resurgence he had under the Ospreys and then going back in at 13 for Wales. But if I'm talking about that standout George North moment, it would have to be, I've got two in my head. I've got the try in Dublin in 2012, where he just crashed. He takes about four players over in the corner of the, the Aviva. And then, then that second one, I think, it's, I think it's 2012. 2012 would have been... Anyway, and then that second one is... Um, his dad storming the pitch in Paris after the, oh, yeah. after the <laughs> the the sole try in Paris in twenty thirteen that was on the way to the championship um, yeah. was was it's just yeah I, I, anything for the Lions I'm a big twenty thirteen Lions nerd anyway I and mean, he, he was just a freak of that tour mm. yeah but for me it's like the very first sky the first try he scored was quite simple and straightforward but in his first season I think it was Judgment Day and he scored against the Dragons and it was just like a little it went outside and outside and he he cut back inside and it just kind of popped off Alec Davis and just kind of came out of nowhere like on the, the tight up view you don't actually see him you just see like a streak of red going past and um, 
so yeah, it, it's stuff like that that you look back on, you, like you say, when he was in his his prime, that was fantastic. What I would say is, so um, Carwin did a a, a poem about him, uh, which we put on our YouTube channel and we put on TikTok as well. Very so, good too. Yeah, it was. It was um, thirty thousand views on a TikTok. And two and a half thousand likes on TikTok, you know. Um, I, I don't know if it's Carwin or George North or a combination of the two, but yeah, it um, it worked really, really well, and it's still on our social media feeds and all of that. If people want to go back and have a listen and have a uh, a look at it, but it was, yeah, pretty good. Enjoyed that one. Yeah, he did a good job at that car with fair play. Harley, mm. do you have a particular North moment to stand out um, for you? I, I do, but I just want to say with Carwin, he sort of, after we'd finished recording uh, our our interview with um, uh, David Allen from the board, he, he basically sort of went, oh, I've just, you know, I was just penning this poem, what do you think? And he was really showing embarrassed about it. I was like, that's fucking brilliant, mate. Let, let's get that out now. <laughs> Yeah, but um, mm. yeah, for me, George North, there's, there's probably two two standouts. One's got to be that um, hat trick against Fiji in the 2011 World Cup. You know, after everyone was there, Roman, you know, the ghost of 2007, and he just comes on on the pitch. I think pretty sure he came in off the bench and just absolutely dismantled them. It was just wonderful. The, the other one for me, it's got to be 2017. So Wales had a bit of a shocking tournament and they spent the whole you know and everyone would spend the whole time saying oh it's all George North being shit he's terrible he's terrible he's terrible he needs to pull up performance and then he just pulls out like one of his best ever games against Ireland and it is usually against Ireland he seemed to always have a good game it's true yeah and you know he's just back to his barnstorming yeah. physical best because you know there were always times like if when he was on the left wing he was really proactive and then he'd be switched to the right and it, it, it's a thing with Welsh wingers like getting moved from the left wing to the right wing just completely mess you up because you know fuck the Tories what <laughs> <laughs> nice reference yeah <laughs> let's carry on then Jay <laughs> okay let's talk about some contract news so Ospreys have signed 21 year old lock Will Great Banks that's a good name isn't it Will Great Banks <laughs> from Pro D Dirty Sawyer um, Great Banks said I've spoken to Toby and it was clear to see that something special is being built at the Ospreys I can't wait to get started fair enough um, Great Banks is Welsh qualified through his father, who was born in Wales. So uh, that's quite an interesting pickup. And then going over to the Scarlets, back rower Ben Williams, he signed a new deal with the Scarlets. The 21 year old has made 19 appearances for the senior side since 2022. And the last bit of news before we move on, I'm quite pleased uh, actually about this. Um, Dai Young, he's back in rugby. So Dai Young has been appointed as Cardiff and Vale College Rugby Academy's new head of rugby. It's Dai Young's first job since he left Cardiff Rugby following those allegations of bullying. So good on him. I've always rated Dai Young as a coach. I've said that a few times on this pod. It's good to see him back involved in Welsh rugby. And yeah, that's the news for this week. Okay, okay. So before we move on to Fantasy League uh, with, with James, I just want to drop a quick note in at the start because it's, it's important for me. <laughs> um, so some of you may or may not know that I'm doing a, an open uni degree and I'm after six years I've been doing this and I'm at the very end of it and I've got to do a survey and an analyse a survey and all of that kind of stuff. So obviously I've chosen uh, to survey ex-rugby players and the effects of the, the the social environment and around rugby club. So I could really do with listeners' help to um, fill it in. It, it takes about 10 minutes. It's completely anonymous, so I don't see names. I don't know who's done it and who hasn't. Um, it takes about 10 minutes or five minutes if you're going really quick. Um, and I'll put the the link on our all our social medias. I'll put a link in the the blurb that we put with all of the, the pods and all that kind of stuff but if you could if you could share it around your clubs or whatever as well um it is something that i want to do in future I, I, you know i think there's a lot of stuff going around and we'll talk about it after about um concussion and the effects of concussion and repeated uh head injuries and uh, when i talk to some of the players i played with it's it's not just at the very top level of the game it's it's all the way down the tree right the way down to the bottom so yeah if you could fill that in 
it would be a massive benefit to me. Uh, um, so yeah, appreciate that. That was just my that's me pulling rank. It's the first time I've done that. I feel powerful now. Right, uh, James, let's do um, let's do fantasy rugby, mate. This this will take me back down a couple of pegs. <laughs> Let me just close all my recent tabs. Um, right. So final round of um, the rap league. Uh, for, I, I reckon we start with Carwin watch actually. Let's see where he ended. Uh, Carwin he ended in thirty ninth, um, which you know it's not bad. I mean I finished in thirty third. Uh, Jamie, where about were you in the end? Oh, you you, do, oh, you, me. you you were in. Yeah, Jamie I, finished in twenty second. Oh, I was twenty seventh. So Jamie wins. Jamie does win out of us four, which is you know. Um, no, what do you want about Cardiff? Don't win anything; they just restore pride. Um, <laughs> go check, go check the tapes of the World Cup fantasy league again. with all of you, last year's women and then Six Nations. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's go through the top ten. So, in tenth, uh, finishing tenth for the the whole. Um, thing is uh, it's still nil nil boys uh, on 1863 then Missile Panda who I believe is that Leslie on Twitter on X sorry big Scottish fan um, on 1867 Morgan Dobbin finishes in 8th 1878 uh, Hatley AWJ which is Dav Hatley uh, he's a uh, listener of the Osprey pod 1896, Atafin Sanity, 1899. Uh, in fifth uh, is Kamicha, 1900. Uh, Fat Boys Gut Club uh, with 1,910 <laughs> points. Uh, Josh L with 1,957. Um, Wooden Spoon Contenders uh, finished second, which means our winner with 1,971 points is Ivan. So we we after we said on last week's pod for various people to get in touch uh, and all of that kind of stuff, and a few people did, but I've forgotten who and I've forgotten where they got in touch with us. So, um, uh, Ivan, if you're listening, get in, get in touch again, mate, because I'm fairly sure that you were one of the ones that got in touch. Uh, yeah, drop us a line again, and we'll get you on next week's pod, and uh, we'll just have a chat about your fantasy league and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, maybe next year. Ali will strap a set of balls on and uh, actually, you know, put his his money where his mouth is and play the game with us. But you know, never mind. One day, Ali, one day you might get successful at it, fella. You know. Okay, fair enough. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's um, let's move on to Wales, Italy. So before we start on Wales, Italy. Let's just put a little bit of context into the conversation that we're going to have. There's been a lot, and you know, I know it feels raw for people, and you know, wooden spoon, and there's a certain generation of people that aren't used to wooden spoons, and and, and what have you, yeah. But there's no excuse for some of the stuff that's been on social media over the weekend. So we'll talk about that at the end. But when we're on a conversation now. If we're not slagging people off, that's not us. That's And you're sitting there and expecting us to slag people off and say he was shit and he was shit and he was shit. That's not what we're going to do. Okay, we'll talk about the game. And if somebody was poor, we'll, you know, we'll try and put that constructively. But if you want to sit there and slag people off, then this is the wrong pod for you. There are other pods there that will sit there and slag other people off. This isn't one of them. So that's... Just putting that there because that really knocked me over the weekend with some of the comments that were there. So, James, let's start with you then. Wales, Italy. Oh, you didn't watch the game. Did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let me give some, let me, <laughs> listeners, let me give some context, right? Um, I, I live in, and Harley will attest to this, the, the season doesn't stop really in England for Six Nations games. Um, so, I was playing. Um, I, Played out at Portsmouth this week, um, and the other team quickly cottoned on 
to the fact that I was Welsh. And every line out of stop in play, they would uh, try and put me off. I shouted the Italy Wales score. Um, uh, so yeah, that's how I was finding out the score. Um, I haven't watched the game. I haven't watched the highlights. Um, I don't intend to, um, because quite frankly, why would I want to depress myself more? Um, I've watched the scrum five stuff, which we'll talk about later. Um, everything I have comes from. Uh, squid rugby <laughs> who I said please just give me a summary of what actually happened in the game um, so yeah I played well though if, you, if anyone was wondering uh, <laughs> he wasn't but anyway thanks anyway for telling us <laughs> yeah uh, right so, Jamie you actually watch I mean you were watching Newport but you you have seen the game since so thoughts yeah, I mean, look, I was in London on the weekend. Um, I went to watch Wimbledon, Newport County. Newport won 2-0. Great result, great performance. Um, so I didn't see the game live. But it was quite funny because when I was at the football, I was checking my phone for the scores. Every time I went on Twitter to check the score, Italy was scoring points. And I said that to my mate. I said, every time I'm logging on now, check the score, Italy is scoring points. And my mate Rob said to me, the best thing to do is just don't look. Don't log on. <laughs> and see what happens. So I didn't check the score until the final whistle went to the football. Mm-hmm. And then I saw the score, it was 24-21. I thought, oh, actually, Wales had done all right. But then, of course, it sank in. The Wales had still won the wooden spoon and, and still lost. So I watched the game back on the train home from London. And I have to say, I was shocked at how bad Wales were. I had really no intention of watching the game in full. I was just going to do what Jay said and just watch the highlights, but I thought, no, i got to watch the game in full because if I'm going to talk about it in the pod, i got to see just how bad Wales were, and by Christ, Wales were bad. I think what disappointed me was there was a lot of talk about Wales embracing the pressure. You know, seeing how big this game was, knowing how big this game was, and trying to avoid that wooden spoon. I honestly thought Wales would come out with a bit of purpose, you know, and it was just so lacklustre, and I was really disappointed. There was no urgency, there was no direction, there was no leadership. It was just a really poor performance from Wales. Really, really disappointed. And you know, I, I made some notes during the game. The takeaways for me, there was just so many errors. You know, so many unforced errors from individuals. So, you know, looking at the game and. Reading the takeaway, so Sam Costello missing three kicks to touch from penalties. Now, that's not acceptable. I'm sorry. You know, I know Sam Costello is learning on the job. I get it. He's new. He's learning his craft at test level. To do it once, it happens to the best of him. But to miss kick, miss touch from a kick three times from penalties, that's just not acceptable. And then you've got Nick Tompkins then, who for me had his worst game playing for Wales. I mean, every time he went in contact, he just kept losing the ball. He had an absolute stinker. And it did make me think maybe we should have kept Owen Watkins at 12, looking back. But that was the decision they went with, and it didn't pay off. You know, the neck roll from Adam Beard. Adam Beard does a neck roll when we're on the attack. Italy win a penalty. They kick it, and that leads then to Lorenzo Pani's try. I mean, it was a great try, by the way. But it came from that neck roll from Adam Beard, so that was disappointing. And then in the first half, you've got that miscommunication then between Sam Costello and Cam Winnett. No communication. Both called for it. Ended up being a knock-on, which led to an Italian scrum in Wales' 22. The scrum was a disaster. Dylan Lewis had a really tough time. I mean, Daniel Fischetti he took him to the cleaners, quite frankly. So there was no platform whatsoever. It was Wales' worst performance, I thought, throughout this tournament. That was a really poor and disappointing performance. And we talked about George North there earlier. What a sad way for him to end his international career. Because the WRU put up that image of him on crutches, walking down the tunnel. That is not the farewell that George North deserved. Really, really grim afternoon, I thought, for him. But it's just a very disappointing way to end what's been a very disappointing campaign. Like Wales have played well in patches. We've, there's been some glimpses of encouragement. You know, guys like Cam Winnett have been great. Rio Dyer, Alan Wainwright, Alex Mann. But to end on that note, the way we did, to put in that performance, 
it just leaves a sour taste in the mouth. And I'm afraid the stats are really grim. So Wales' first six nations won and spoon since 2003. Wales have now lost 12 of the past 13 Six Nations matches. This is seven successive Six Nations home defeats. And we had a successful World Cup campaign. We proved a lot of people wrong by getting out to that pool. But Gat since Gatlin's return to Wales, he's been in charge of 10 Six Nations matches and he's won just one game. So the stats are there, it's grim. And I honestly do not know now where Welsh rugby goes from here. You know, I, I think Welsh rugby, we talked about doing our Dragon's Layer pod last night, me and Gavin, and Gavin said now Welsh rugby is in an existential crisis now, and it does feel like that way. Welsh rugby is in the shit, but we've only got ourselves to blame. Because for far too long, as we all know, when Wales were winning trophies, they were winning Grand Slams and championships, they ignored the pro game. They underfunded the pro teams for too long because they were so top-heavy, the WRU, they didn't care about the grassroots. They didn't care about the pro game. And now the chickens have come home to, re to roost. We are reaping what we've sowed. And that's down to the WRU's mismanagement of the pro game and the underfunding. And now we are where we are. So mm. it's really grim times for Welsh rugby. And I honestly do not know now where we go from here. But I do know that big decisions have to be made. There needs to be a strategy and some clear thinking because Welsh rugby is in crisis. Big oh. time. I was going to say we'll 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 talk about the future after we've talked about the game. But, uh, oh, uh, of so, course, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 if somebody wants to take Jamie's soapbox away, I, I dare you I, to. I, 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 I'm hoping I have actually watched the game. Uh, like James, I was I was playing on the weekend, and uh, I'll be honest, I felt a lot like most of the most of the pack, which was somehow ending up with shit ball coming from even worse ball and just getting absolutely fucking battered. The only difference is they at least got a losing bonus point out of it. <laughs> but I mean, going back to say, there was nothing new. That is an issue there. It's all been the same thing. It's been the same thing since Gatlin left the first time. We don't seem to have any way of getting game line success reliably. It's too much one-up runners. The scrum's a fucking issue. When the lineup works, mm. it's great. But then we're not getting the opportunity to do it. And it's stupid errors every time. And it doesn't, I don't think it matters who you chuck in. I think you're absolutely right. Gatlin had his plan for a big farewell for North and 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 with you know knowing Tompkins is probably the best balance for, for him. But frankly, Owen Watkins was actually given us game line. He's a much steadier hand at 12, which helps when you've got an experienced 10 instead of being a full-on chaos monkey. That's not a slot on Tompkins, that's just how he plays. Which when you've got a very experienced 10 like Owen Farrell or Dan Bigger. They know how to manage that and to get the best out of him. When you're learning on the job, what you don't want is someone, at the person who's supposed to be your release valve, to be going fucking crazy. So that's why I think it improves so much when Mason Grady came in at 12. Because Costello was like, right, I've got, I don't know what else to do. Right, go go make 10 yards. And it worked because he's a big lad. Uh, the, I mean, I had an argument with you about the, the clashing heads of Winnet and Costello. If you look how Wales set it, their backfield, that was Winnett's ball all day. It was in his half, you know, because Sullivan should have been there ready for the clearance kick. No, that's how backfield set up. Yeah, but he's running on to the ball, mate. That's, uh, that's, They're both that's running the on to it. Costello think... was supposed to be taking that wider thing. He was supposed to be there for that for a kick wide, from wider. I think that's, the issue, I think the issue is... Costello can ping it. I think the issue is, is what Jamie said, is there was no communication between the two. You of can them. hear, you can hear, you can hear them both saying it's my ball, and then, but none of them. No. Need and if one, but if then, if one, that's why, that's but, why Winnet looks so annoyed because it's like I've actually been marshalling backfield all all season and doing very well at mm. it. Costello's had three games outside the Six Nations and World Cup. Mm. Anyway, go on. It's, it's, but it's and it's the same issues, and then the scrum. I mean, how is this scrum like? When you take the, all these players and you put them in, even like even the Cardiff props, yes, they're not great in the scrum time, but they're at least holding their own against the equivalent players in Benetton. Carol Thomas is, you know, fantastic scrummer for for the Ospreys. Dylan Lewis has been playing quite well off the bench for Harlequins. What have they been told to do scrum time? That is just causing it to be. I mean, hopefully James can come in being the being the the, the resident front rower. <laughs> But I don't get why it's so bad and it hasn't... And the only consistent thing, because we've changed through different players, we've had different head coaches, the only consistent thing is the forwards coach. So is it how he's telling them to scrummage? 
because he's always opened in interviews about how he wants it to be a pushing contest, which we saw against France. We will fucking lose if we're up against big lads. So it's, it's really one thing I would say is we got a lot more ben, a lot more impact than go forward when the bench came on, because that was where all the anyone who could do ball carrying was basically on the bench. Mm. And it does make you wonder: should you have changed that selection slightly? But then, look, the second row, you either lose the fantastic work David Jenkins is doing in the second row, or you lose Adam Beer's lineout option. Uh, Mackenzie Martin has less caps than I do for Sidma second team. <laughs> like that's I'm liking the that, comparison. That's not even a joke. Like I have more, <laughs> I have more caps for a rugby team than Mackenzie Martin, and I have not, and I've basically start picked up, started picking up the rugby ball this year. Like, so you can't really start him, and. You know, and, you know, some news came out just before the Italy game about Josh Adams. So he's having to have his knees drained every thing. So we've all been saying, look, it's clear as day he's not fit. They've now released an article saying it's fit. So why was he selected? Like, even if you're not in your long-term plans, maybe you do bring in a, a Keelan Giles, you know, because it's someone who is an experience, at least he's experienced at regional level. It may not be what you want, but it's someone who say, or you start Grady, who has been playing very well on the wings of Cardiff. It's just... I'll be honest, it was just this tournament. That 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 Italy game, I think, was a complete microcosm for everything that has been going wrong with that Wales squad for that for this whole block. Mm. Don't want me to talk about scrums, because I will. But <laughs> we're going to assume that James knows what he's talking about here. Now let's let's just <laughs> let's just be careful. James, tell us about scrummages. Uh so you look at that front row on the weekend, right? So you have Dylan Lewis, who notoriously wasn't the best scrummager when he was at the Blues, right? He was known for his work rate around the field, his work over the ball. Uh, he was never, he was a fine, like, as in average scrummager. He's had his moments, like, I'm thinking back in uh, South Africa last year, uh, the Taurus of Africa um, showed up very well there. So let's, let's say you're working with, a, at best, a six and a half out of ten tight end, right? You've got Gareth Thomas, who is a good scrummager, but he is not a technically good scrummager. He's not a loose head that's going to get under you. He's a he's he's, he's a, probably like a loose head who's going to go through you. He's far much strength type thing, right? And then you have Elliot D in the middle, who I love Elliot D, and I've said this to Jamie every time. I think he's a fantastic player. I think he's an underrated ball carrier. I think he's a great great around the park, but he is very small. Right, so instantly, if you're saying out of that three, Gareth Thomas is, is the strongest there. You've got two thirds of that front row is underpowered. You look at that Italian front row; that's pure, you know, that's Italian beef. That's the you know, that's the that's the good stuff. That's that good bolognese. That's the stuff cooked in red, you know, red wine. Right, so instantly, if you're going to go off Hump's comments and say this is a pushing contest, then you're buggered. Now, what do you change there? Well, obviously, tight end is a problem for us. We haven't got tight end, right, really. And the only one you can think of is maybe is Thomas Francis. But he's old and he's not coming back to Wales. So instantly there, you take away Thomas Francis. Now, the glimpses I've seen of Harry O'Connor, he's a big lad, strong lad, technically sound, but is raw, right? Is very raw. And... The test arena is not the place to, to you know, sharpen your tool belt. Mm. Right? And I'm going to be nice to Scarlet's boys this week because, quite frankly, it's getting fucking boring there. I sound um, like you. Yeah. <laughs> but no, he, he, he's got... And I said this to Hugh Griffin, right? Scarlet's with props, right? And it's the same with Cardiff a bit. They've got all the, all the talent there, but there's no development in terms of prop pathway. Prop pathways are very different to, like, a 10 or a centre or a seven, right? Because it's a specialist position, right? That requires a very special set of skills. So you've got someone like Dylan Lewis who's had to, who is only now, uh, what is he, 29? Is going to Harlequins where he's working under bomb, right? It's not often I agree with Stephen Thomas from Wales Online, right? He put out his article saying, Nicky Smith was injured at the start of Six Nations, right? Fair enough. 
but he wasn't by the end. There is no shame in calling it Mickey Smith, even if it just shores up your scrum. Right? And again, Ken Zimathias, I'm sure he has... You know, he's not good, put himself in the best light in terms of a scrimmage in this season. Right? And um, thinking back to the um, Scarlet's Cardiff game at the park, um, really struggled there. You know, it, last year against Ospreys, he really struggled. So... Why have him on the bench when you could just call it Mickey Smith with 46 caps to just sit there, maybe come on with a penalty or two? Evan Lloyd, right? I said this last week. It's not Evan Lloyd's fault. He's very green. He's played 156 minutes of rugby, right? He's He's got to come on. There were two caps on the, between the three front rows on the weekend. Three, if you can, uncapped one that Harry O'Connor has against the Barbarians. That is a joke, right? Now, I'm not saying Tom Boater is the answer. I'm not saying that calling up uh, Sam Parry to sit on the bench instead of Evan Lloyd is the answer, right? What I'm saying is you've got... It, it, the front row is not a place where you cut your teeth at international level when you're learning rugby, right? It's the exact same way that on the weekend when I played this third team game, which is a mixture of vets and uh, Colts coming up to senior rugby, where we had an 18-year-old saying... Uh, literally freshly turned 18 year old hooker saying can I play uh, front row this game I was like right when did you turn 18 uh, uh, last week no you're not doing that for your first game against a bunch of 45 year old men like, it's not like, it's not the place to. you've got to train you've got to do all this there's two caps on that front row bench that is despicable for me the issue is though James it is at some point, you have to develop. At some point, everybody's got to start with zero caps, and everybody's yeah, no. got to take. It. And I think the issue is is having three of them all in the same position at the same time. Yeah, you know, and and Gatlin can't turn around and say, "Well, you know, this is what I was handed. This is ten, fifteen years worth of his development, his." control of the Welsh game and we'll talk about this in a minute, the difference between Gatland and Hanson, yeah, is Gatland isn't involved in anything other than that 25, that, that 35 players, maybe 40 if he gets a few more in. And I think that's where he, he's realising now that you know, what you're saying is bang on right. You know, and I said it to you last week. It's, why have we got Kemsley Mathias there? Who I, I've, I've, you know, I've seen him. Like that a lot, to be fair. But, no, but he's he's, yeah. a, he's a real decent player. But like you say, you're going from, I think he's played maybe two games in, in 40 minutes for the Scarlets over the season. And then you go right now, go and play international rugby. That's, that's not what you need to do. And you would have thought so, somebody like Gatlin would be able to say, actually, all right, I'll have him in, a, in training camp because he's part of the future, but he's in training camp. And then he goes back. And then next year, we'll know what he's doing when he's coming. So let me take you through something I've been noticing. So I've been going back and watching, and there is a point to this, right? I've been watching, um, it started off because we were covering Ospreys versus Munster this week on the IRE. And I went back to the semi final win in 2012, right? Um, it was Paul James's last game at the time. So he had 100, whatever it was, 168 caps for Ospreys at the time. Let's call it that, right? Who was the next cab off the rank was Ryan Bevington at the time, who was touted to be one of the next big props in Wales, never really worked who got injured. From there, right, if you look at the, the just loose sense that, if you look at the development of loose sense, just at the Ospreys, there was a conveyor belt because they were being brought through at the right time. Okay, so you had, um, at one point, so you had uh, Duncan Jones, Paul James, Ryan Bevington, Nicky Smith, and then Mark Thomas, right? That was like your conveyor belt of props going through. Now, that filtered up then to Wales, and that's just the Ospreys now. You know, I'm thinking at the Scarlets, you had Samson Lee, right? You had um, 
you know, hockey, Ken Owens, right? But there was there was a clear progression at the time of caps rolling in because all of a sudden they were rolling into their first international camps. I remember Nicky Smith made his debut in the 2014, 2015 season. By the time he went into that first international camp, he'd had hundreds of minutes at pro level. Mm. What we're seeing now is because of a lack of development. This comes from the regional, it's, it's, it's as much a regional sort as it is lack of funding and lack of resources, is that players are being parachuted into a camp now, like Evan Lloyd, like Alex Mann, like Cam Winnett, like Mackenzie Martin, right, with no minutes, because that's what we're being forced to, because of the, because of the, uh, when Gatlin left, he hadn't uh, kept anyone new from the, the golden generation, or the ones he had kept, you know, didn't, it didn't work out, so look at James Davis, never really worked out at international level, had to retire due to injury. Various other players, Josh Turnbull never really made it international level. Josh McLeod never got captain of Gatlin, but was always injured. Ollie Griffiths, Harrison Kenny. Going to pivot, awesome. then you had the willy nilly selection, uh, right? And then this is all in Gatlin, in Gatlin's face. He's had to do it, though. And unfortunately, the front row is the place where you're going to suffer the most. You can get away with it at back row, or you can get away with it really at 10, right? You can't get away with it at the front row. You will. It it, it pains me. That, that that's my that's my finished rant on the front row. I won't, I won't talk about it anymore. I mean, so, one thing I'll just to add before we move on, and because you know before you know before blood vessels start bursting in Jamie's head. Um, if you look at the warm ups, Gatling was trying to do so. You know, you'd have Will Davis King being put in with, you know, Gareth Thomas. And, and it did, right? It's not the strongest front row, but it's two experienced internationals and one newbie. Kemsley Mathias was with, like, Elias, someone who, so you've got a club dealership, and Thomas Francis. You know, they, they were trying to put these, you know, you're at least trying to have, like, an experienced player in that front row each time. I I think the problem is, is, like, Evan, you know, Gatlin even said, Evan Lloyd wasn't supposed to play the Six Nations. But why, when... Elias was in any doubt at all. Did you not call up a Sam Parry, even if it was just to sit on that bench, that one game, just so that you've got someone who knows what it is, especially if you're going to decide that the two players, the two younger props you have given caps in the next two, you're not going to bother, you, you know, you're going to leave them holding tackle bags for a week. You know, if you're going to bring on like a, you know, give a prop on his debut, don't put him next to two players who've got one cap each. Because the one, because the one prop, even though it's his second time being named on the bench of the Six Nations, you didn't use mm. because you didn't think he was quite ready for international level. Like, why just call a squad with four sets of front rows and say these guys are just developmental? And you know, you saw what happened to Archie Griffin. He basically got crocked in his first game. You know, that was his first like high level intensity game because all his games for Bath have been Premiership Cup level, which are a little until you get to the knockouts are a little bit lower. Standard because it's meant to be a development competition, even though some teams take it a bit too seriously. Like, why? If you, you know, Gatlin's is supposedly one of the best man managers, and that's what makes him a good head coach. I think his man management of this squad has been fucking atrocious. And I know we said we we're going to pick on, you know, individuals, but <laughs> at the end, ultimately, the, bo- the buck does stop with Gatland. Yeah. You know, he's, you know, he's picking a winger who's basically just about getting through. And, you know, you're basically using medieval leeches to keep his knees from exploding. It's infuriating. I get with some players like Alex Mann and Cam Winnett, at least they've been playing regularly week in, week out. But most of them just, you know, I said, Evan Lloyd shouldn't be anywhere near that squad. Hmm. I thought it was a typo and he meant Evan Daniel when they announced the squad in the first place. And even then I thought that was a bit of a weird one because Evan Daniel hasn't had anything. It's, I mean, yeah, go on, Jamie, because I'm going to just carry on. Well, shall we talk about what Warren Gatlin said after the game? Because that leads us on to. I haven't said about. I, I'm the only one that actually watched the fucking game, but. Yeah, because you're going to talk about George Wilson. <laughs> I, we all, I watched it. No, sorry, you go and yeah, have your seat, and then like, we'll yeah, lead on to Gatlin. Yeah. I do apologise. Go yeah. on then. So, so my bit was that for within the scrum, you know, the the scrum was fucking shoddy but i think that goes right the way through the pack it's it isn't just the front row the the front row you've got a relatively inexperienced second row until roland's comes on 
your back row isn't necessarily um, experienced either. You know, you've got Wayne Wright who's played at six and a little bit at eight. But in terms of, you know, can you bring all of that together? You need somebody within that pack or at coaching level to bring that pack together. And I just thought we 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 found reverse gear really, really quickly. And and I, I, you know, what we haven't said so far is how well Italy played. You know, and, yeah, and I we think should pay them full, credit yeah, actually, shouldn't we? Yeah, absolute absolutely. credit to them. But I think the difference with Italy was five years ago, six years ago, maybe they started developing their under 18s and their under 20s, and they put a lot of money into developing their under 18s or under 20s. All of their under 20s went to um, uh, to Benetton or to, uh, or um, Zebra, mainly to Benetton. You know, so they they kept them within the system. They'd have a a little spell across the border in France, and they they toughen them up, and then they but they they went. Do you know what? We we we're, we're going to develop a side. We're not going to magic a side up. We're not going to put 15 players on the park today and expect miracles. We're going to develop a side. And the players that you see on that on that pitch for Italy now were the players that they've been developing for the last five, ten years. You know, Stephen Varney, that got released from the Scarlets, you know, he's a Krummach boy, got released from the Scarlets. I think he went to someone in England uh, and then he ended. No, he went somewhere else, and then he ended up at Gloucester, I think. I might be wrong, but I think he went. He, he played like a Division Two side, uh, uh, Championship side, or whatever. And then I think he was at Hartbury, the actual side in Championship. That would make sense. Yeah, yeah, he probably played Hartbury and then went to Gloucester. Um, but you know, Italy were were kind of on that development right the way through. Soon as he he kind of showed any sign of the fact that okay, I might not be. 100% committed for playing Wales here. Italy were on it. And they've shown what it takes to actually develop a side. Whereas we're running around like a bunch of headless chickens trying to punch each other in the face in a dark room with no idea about who we're punching or, or what we're punching or how to punch. And having been through this a couple of times, yeah, I, I, since early 80s I've been involved in in rugby one way or another yeah when my dad was playing and you watch it on the on the telly and you see what's happening and all of that kind of stuff and then you see it happening again and then you see it happening again and we're just hell bent on ripping each other apart rather than taking a step back and and I think this comes back to communication from the WRU and from Gatland and you know from everyone else to say right okay this is what we're going to do. Nobody nobody within that Welsh setup has said, do you know what this is what this season this is what we're aiming for this season. You know we might have a problem here we might have a problem there but this is what we want to get out of this season and as fans this is what you can expect this season and this is what we're doing to develop that. And. He's come in with this big fucking halo. Of, Look at me, I'm the, I'm the savior. That that first grand slam he had was Hanson's grand slam. You know, all the work for that year had been done building up to it. Yeah, done by the um, spray, you mean? Yeah, I think you're thinking of the 2005 grand slam, the Reddick one. Sorry, yeah, and that would have been after yeah, Hanson, sorry, yeah. yeah, and then when we come into to Gatlin's one, it's kind of he's sitting there with a really well developed team. It yeah. certainly wasn't Gareth Jenkins, I tell you that. No, but <laughs> Gareth Jenkins, is, yeah. we, we go, but this, this is my point, yeah? We'll sit there and we go, oh, he was shit and he was shit and he was shit, yeah? And people go, but, oh, you know, um, payback selected 50-odd players and all that kind of stuff, yeah? So some of those players needed to be selected and have come through. People like Reffel have come through, yeah, and have shown to be absolutely superb players, yeah? Costello. All right, he didn't have a good game on, on the weekend, but he's shown that he's perfectly capable, yeah? So that's why I say we, we, we're obsessed with let's sit there and slag each other off instead of let's sit back and go, right, what actually needs doing? Because there's a whole load of stuff in Welsh rugby that needs doing that isn't on that pitch on, on Saturday, but it's all the stuff that leads to that pitch. So, you know, I thought... I. I I tried to find some positives in that game on Saturday. I could not find any. No, it's tough, you isn't know. it? 
I was, I was, I was genuinely looking at stuff and going, "What can we, what can we talk about in a in a positive light that went well?" And there was nothing. I tell you what, I found we used five people in the lineup. Yeah, we have yeah. five catchers in the lineup. So great. Costello caught a lineup. Yeah, how the fuck that happens, I don't know. But uh, it's quick <laughs> yeah. throw in. we've well, got. I, I've had this argument with you every time. It's. It... They class the quick throw in as a, a thing, as a lineup. But you know, realistically, we. I, we... I caught a lineup. I, I never actually went in the lineup at all on the weekend. It was just the other team just really badly overthrew it. <laughs> but you know, we, we've we've developed four lineup jumpers. Uh, Adam Beard did nothing else around the rest of the pitch he, he had five line outs yeah. um, he did because I've checked the stats today mate yeah he, uh, yeah. Uh, he had a I really have, yeah. really no cool he game. conceded the penalty no no <laughs> By, he was the lowest in terms of uh, contact he was the lowest in terms of uh, meters beyond contact he was the lowest in terms of meters made he was the lowest in terms of carries Literally, the but only he, thing, the doesn't only do thing, that. yeah, but the, that's so, so, right. you're six, you know yeah. But when Sam you're six, foot eight, scrimmaging was shit. No, I'm, when I'm you're no six foot eight, because that's I not know. what he does. No, when you're I'm six foot eight, eight, none of our forwards carry. When you're six foot eight and 18 and a half, 19 stone, and your second row, your job is to carry the ball into contact. <clears> yeah, he passed the ball nine times, he took the ball into contact once. Yeah, his job as a second row should be to go into contact and suck in three or four players. He's a big boy. He's a heavy boy. He's a quick boy. Yeah, he needs to be doing that role. To turn around to him and say, be a distributor at ten, which is what he ended up being. He passed the ball nine times. Yeah, he passed the ball the same amount of times as the Italian outside half. Yeah. And and that's why I mean, we 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 we're in that position where actually we need a bit of bulk. When when Rollins came on, that's why it looked like Rollins was having a massive impact because he was actually doing the job of a second row and and taking it on. Yeah. Right? Can I can I say you're both absolutely right in what you're saying? Okay. Lee is right in terms of saying that Adam Beard, for his size, should carry better. And Harley is right in saying. That's not what Adam Beard is in the team for, right? You are both absolutely right. And as someone, as the person who has literally watched Adam Beard since his debut and probably watched every game that Adam Beard played for the Ospreys, right? Adam Beard has never been a carrier, right? He he can carry. I've seen it. And he's a, he hits lovely lines, right? He, he, he runs the right angles, right? He has never been a carrier. It's probably the weakest part of his game. He has always been a fantastic distributor of the ball. He has got one of the best passes and range of passing from a forward that I have seen, right? He has always, by any, any team that has used him, has used him to distribute the ball. If you look at any of the games Ospreys have won, lost, drawn, whatever, right? He is the, the forward that passes the ball most, right? He's got high offload stats, and he's also, you know, it, it, that that that's what he, he's always that he's a link player. Now, Lee, you are absolutely right that he should be carrying the ball more. He's six foot eight and weighs an ungodly amount, right? He should carry more. But you're it, you, you're asking a player to to do something he's never done and step and step out of doing no right. But that's that's kind of my that's my point, James. Yeah, is yeah, yeah, no, we've, we've, I'm not finished. But let, so let me finish the bit that I was talking about. We're trying to find positivity, yeah, where the only positivity that you've got for Adam Beard is the line out, but actually, you've also developed three other jumpers in that line out. That could, so actually, mm -hmm. we don't rely on Adam Beard in there. So when yeah. Rollins comes in, yeah, you've then got a ball carrier, and you look at the, I think, as a whole. Our forwards made less than seventy meters with ball in hand. At international level, you cannot do that. That's, no, like, saying, that's like saying an outside half can kick three meters and and have a good game. It's it's not. But yeah, but we, we need also... to get back to what the second rows do. What what do 
what does the back row do? Yeah. And with the, with the best will in the world, we need somebody in there that's going to make big meters. But you're also harking back to roles that arguably don't exist on a rugby pitch anymore. Italy did right? it, mate. Italy yeah, did it. England did no, it. Ireland did it. Right. Okay. But you, you, there's no bulk in that back row either. But yet, we're so use the boys with bulk. No, 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 no. That's, that's what, what, what I'm but, saying. But what I'm we... saying is, what, what I'm saying is, right? Yeah, you absolutely. You've got Adam Beard, right? He's he's a line up He's at five lineups in the weekend. He passed the ball ten times, right? Then you've got who's who's your other second row? Dav Jenkins. He only carried seven times. Didn't make many meters, but he hits rucks. Right, he, he, was, he was our top he tackle. Uh, he he yeah. was sorry. No, he was one tackle behind Raffle. I think it was one yeah. or two tackles. Uh, I'll tell you now. I have got the stats here. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so that's what he is. He's, he's Ian Goff from Fourth Call, right? He's the Fourth Call Ian Goff, is, is essentially what David Jenkins is. Then you've got, right, who are your back rowers, right? So if you play Rafael, obviously Rafael's a fetcher. Yeah, there's no doubt in saying he's a, he's a fetcher. He's there to jackal the ball, right? Who's the number eight? What, what's, what's Wainwright do? Wainwright is a main source of lineup ball and he's a carrier. Right, Wales have never, in the modern era, apart from Luke Charteris, Wales have never used their second rows as like main source of lineup ball. Ne- not in Gatlin's era have, apart from Charteris, have Wales used second rows as their main source of lineup ball. Who was the main source of lineup ball for Wales? It was Justin Tipton. Wait, no. No. Last weekend it was Wayne, right? I, I talk about After, the, in yeah. that era. But the, the, the point there, so we, it, I, I don't what I don't want to do is go down, you know, like slagging people. I'm not slagging beard off. What I'm saying is, right, but we need to look at why why is this just take that 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 game on Saturday, yeah, and take strip away all the other bollocks. We still should have won that game on Saturday if we'd have played the right the the managed the people correctly, yeah. Wound them up, prepared them for that game properly, and put the right people on the path. And that's where Gatlin and his his halo complex, where I can't do any wrong, is tripping us up at the minute. Yeah, and I think there's there's the the analogy I I always use with my players and with with committees and with clubs and all of that kind of stuff is it's it's a jigsaw. And everybody within that jigsaw needs to know where they are, what they're doing, and they need to know that overall picture. And at the minute, I don't think we've got an overall picture, and I don't know how each of those players fits into that jigsaw to make that picture. Okay? And that was my... I I really looked to try and find some positives, and there weren't any. And, and, And that's where... I'm struggling with it. But I want to move on from that from a second, yeah, because because we've got to you know, before we move on to the 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 rest of it, I just want to talk about that head contact between Grady and the small Italian. Lorenzo Pani. That's the boy. So Jamie, what 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 did you make of, of that contact? Because it looked it looked worse in slow motion where you see the water coming off and the sweat coming off. It looked horrendous. But what what did you make of that? Well, just to say that on Saturday, I didn't see the game live, as I said, but I had a message from Progressive Rugby. They got in contact with me and they said, Hi Jamie Fowin, I hope you're well. And they told me this. So Progressive Rugby were deeply disappointed with the decision not to remove either Lorenzo Pani or Mason Grady from the field as a precaution following a clash of heads in the 61st minute of the Six Nations fixture between Wales and Italy. Professor John Faircliff said the failure to remove either Lorenzo Pani or Mason Grady following a clear and obvious high-speed clash of heads again causing to question the elite game's desire to cement the welfare of its players as its number one priority. We ask again that we learn the lessons of the past and the default position to be to err on the side of caution to mitigate risk to short and long-term brain health. Now, I watched that game back on Sunday and I saw the incident. And first of all, they reviewed it for foul play and I think it was the right decision by the referee 
to class it as a rugby incident because they were reviewing it to see if Mason Gray did commit a foul play. And I do agree, it was just one of those unfortunate incidents. However, I have to say, having seen the incident, I am really surprised that neither player went off at HIAs. Panny came off the worst of it, and he was in no man's land. He was. He fucked. looked absolutely yeah. fucked. Yeah. So I, I don't normally like questioning these decisions because I'm not a healthcare professional, and I think a lot of people spout off about this, and they're not qualified to do so. So I'm very cautious about, you know, I'm not a healthcare professional. I don't know. But to me, and if progressive rugby and their, you know, professor is saying they should have gone off, then clearly they should have gone off. And you saw the incident as well, Lee. Mm. Would you agree that they should have gone off HIAs? I was very surprised. Yeah, I mean, I'd have expected a HIA as a bare minimum. And the, the thing is, is this year they've trialled these these. Um, gum shields, which they've been trialing in academies and in uh, URC games for a couple of years now, and there's a little sensor inside these um, gum shields, and if you get anything, any head contact or whatever, that makes the gum shield move at a certain rate, then it's a HIA, and and there's alarms go off in somebody's um, things that says you know we need to pull this player off for a, a, a HIA. But just looking at that, even at full speed, the guy is sparked on the floor. You know, it was a, ch- yeah, a chip yeah. over the top or it was a bouncing ball or whatever it was. And both players are going for the ball. So I, I get, you know, it was a rugby incident. Yeah, I get that. That doesn't stop you caring for the player's welfare. And to not... Uh, you know, I think sometimes referees try to separate themselves too much. You know, you've got two players on the floor, both sparked. You've got the Italian um, physio running onto the pitch, and the first thing he does is he goes into the neck brace position behind the player on the floor. So he's seen something. You know, you don't you don't go into that position as your automatic first place. You know, he's seen something, and he's gone. Yeah. There's there's something there which needs to be looked at. How did nobody else pick that up and say, do you know what, we got at least one player sparked, another player groggy, let's get them off. I, I think it's disgraceful. I really, really mm-hmm. do. Particularly with all the other stuff that's going on with, with head injuries, concussions. On the weekend, we saw the first uh, guy in Australia the first rugby league player to uh, die from um, the uh, head injuries. Um, I forget what the condition's called, which probably isn't a good thing. But do you know what I mean? Yeah, we're, we're starting to see the effects of it now of guys that have been doing this for the last 10, 15, 20 odd years. These people are, uh, are now in a position where they, they can't remember their kids' names. They can't remember where they live. They can't feed themselves and now they're dying and we're worried about, oh, are Wales going to come back from this and put five points on and we need to keep Grady on the pitch? It's just, it's not it's not right. It's not right. Yeah, very surprising. Very surprising, I have to say. Mm. Right. Can we talk about Juan Gatlin's comments after the game? Because I think we do need to talk about this. Which so... ones? <laughs> which which, <laughs> which, which t- ones do you want to start off? Do you want to start on the George North ones where he said he was better 10 years ago than he is now? Do you want to start on the ones after the game where he said I should resign, or do you want to do the scrum five ones where he, where he said I'd never go and watch a regional game? Right. Well, let's talk about what he said after the game at the press conference. So, Warren Gatlin revealed that he offered his resignation to the WRU CEO, Big Ov rejected. Okay. So Gatlin was asked by a journalist if he planned to stay in the job until the twenty twenty seven World Cup in Australia. Gatlin said this. Yes, absolutely. I've made that commitment. I just said to Abby in the changing room, if you want me to resign, I'm quite happy to do that. He said, like hell, that's the last thing I want. That's what I'm really afraid of. But I can promise you we'll go away and review this really carefully. We've already done some review stuff and we'll work on areas that need to improve. I think this was really clever by Gatland. Because what he's done there is killed the speculation dead straight away after the game. Because there would have been a lot of speculation in the media. 
online with fans and pundits mostly, just so first of all, he's killed it dead. He's controlling the narrative. And this is something that he actually wrote about in his Daily Telegraph column, because he's written about this throughout the Six Nations. He spoke about controlling the narrative. This is what Gatlin's doing now. He controls the narrative. He killed the speculation dead. Secondly, he knew full well, he put his resignation in, if it's believed to be true, he knew full well that WRU were never going to sack him. He knows that. He knows he's untouchable now because the WRU have paid a lot of money to bring Gatland in, right? The WRU last year paid £2 million in severance pay. Half of that went to Steve Phillips. There is no way they're going to pay Gatland off now. The money isn't there. And also, Abby Tierney, she's only been in the job for less than three months. No chance was she going to make a huge decision like that to say to Gatland, yes, actually, we will accept your resignation. So I thought Warren Gatland has been very clever by doing that because he's controlling the narrative. He's killing the speculation dead. We saw it on Scrum 5 on Sunday night. Yet again, Warren Gatland, he went on there. To be fair, he fronted up. Lauren Jenkins asked him some difficult questions. But he was controlling the narrative, saying, we're building for the next World Cup. We need time. We need patience. We've got youngsters. We're learning. He knows what he's doing, Gatlin. He's not dumb. But here's the question I got for you, lads. And I asked this on my Dragon Slayer pod last night. Should the WRU have accepted Gatlin's resignation? Do you do any of you actually think Abby Tierney should have made a big decision? Because Andrew Coombe said that she's already failed in her first big test. So do any of you think Abby Tierney should have said, yeah, OK, well, then we'll accept your resignation. Or do you think it was right for Abby Tierney to reject it? Any of you can answer that. I think it'd be great for her to call his bluff. Because he had, I don't think he had any intention of actually resigning. I think, like, you you said, internal narrative. My, my big, the big problem is, who do you get in? That, that's the thing. The only coach available is probably Jamie Joseph. Mm. And do do you think anyone really outside, like, I mean, Ron Gatlin was a bit of an unknown, apart from being known, he, he hated an island when he came in. It's, yeah, I, there's not really anyone to bring in. And, you know, are you going to promote one of the regional coaches? Dwayne Peel. On his booth and James would kill us. <laughs> You'd say that. <laughs> like, I mean, Die Young, Promote him out of the Catholic role because he won't be paid enough to, you know, need to worry about that. But then you're going to have the same issue with Pivak. Or any any time we've had a regional coach come in, the other three will go, oh, well, he's just picking we're, all his boys. We're not having that. That's oh, all his boys. Yeah, we're not having that. Yeah. And, you know, and Daniel Young left under enough of a cloud with that. Mm. You know, and let's be fair, would even the Cardiff players want to play for him? Never mind the other regions. It's... Mm. Gatlin knows he's got he, he got this year's grace. I think his bullshit before the tournament where he tried to do his usual thing of trying to big up the team just didn't work. Because I've said, I, I just don't think we've got the structure or the cohesion going. You know, like the reason why you can sometimes, you can throw a novice 10 into a system is if you've got a good system in place. That's why it's worked well with Ireland. Yeah. Whereas we're basically trying to re, redo things from scratch and I just don't think the level of detail's there. And again, like, Frankly, yes, do you know what? We've had a shit, shit Six Nations. But remember, that's only our second wooden spoon in, in Six Nations time. Actually, arguably sh- could have and should have won the first two games. The France game were fine. I think that was an absolute selection balls up on Gatland. He should have put more power on the bench and not just, you know, inexperienced kids. Well, that, that's by the pipe. I think the, the proof of the pudding is that I think we need to I almost feel like we need to forget Dean Wells at the moment. I know it's hard to say because it does generate the income. <clears throat> but until we sort out what the where the W is allocating money, like I feel like Sam Warbson's put and um, Dave Buttress's points mm. that have been on Twitter since have been far more important than this distraction, the dead cat like Gatlin's thrown out. If anything, that I feel like that's help, helping the WRU more than any more than anything because what we should be focusing is well. Why are our under twenties so chronically underpowered? Why are our under eighteens only able to get fluke wins against teams when all their best players are gone? You know why? Why is everyone so underpaid? Why is it? Why is the fitness like? If Gatlin isn't happy with the coaching at, at the range, why isn't he more hands on with it? One thing I would say is when they were asking about his um, 
like, you know, oh, do you go and watch the games? Well, they're going to be getting footage from all, all the cameras in those games. And frankly, you will see far more from that footage than you will standing on the pitch. I don't care what you say. I I'm will part of you go to the games and I'll watch stuff and think, what the fuck was that about? And I have to go back and watch the game to find out. So, I, you know, I, I don't think... I think I, the only reason you want the UK head coach there showing up face is because then it gives people the impression, oh, he's there and it's seen. I doubt there's less an, there's any less an analysis going on. I mean, you know, he's not him, you know, freezing yeah, his ass off in Planethi on a Friday night. You, you could do it in the middle of summer, mate. It's fucking freezing. But the, the, the point of him going to games and going to training sessions and spending training time sessions at, is the one I, I yeah do but, but spending but time games. well even, even spending time at um just uh, just out in the regions yeah is he gets to talk to people and he gets to understand you know that's a two-way conversation going back and forth and that's what he misses when he sat at home in New Zealand reviewing all the videos that have come in from the weekend that's that's lovely yeah that's that's great what he doesn't get is what it means to the fans that turn up every week yeah he doesn't i i went to see uh uh scarlet's osprey's game boxing day years and years and years ago and parked in the morrison's car park didn't get a fine for it which you would do now nobody parked there now you get a fine um but the car I followed behind had um, Howley and Jenkins. Yeah. So I parked. I said, oh, fuck this. I'm just going to go and park wherever they are. And I walked in with my boy. And we, we you know, if you've been to the stadium, you know, the that bit where you walk down. And I was quite pleasant to Howley at the time. And I just had a chat with him. But you know what? They, they were both there talking to players, uh, uh, talking to fans. They, they 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 were both you know just being polite and all of that kind of stuff, but they were there. They were showing their face and they were talking to people and they were like you know what are you expected and who are you all of that kind of stuff. You don't get that sat at home in New Zealand watching a video, and I think that's some of the stuff that we spent so long trying to take out of the game that we've gone too far. We, we've lost the passion. We've lost that bit that when it comes down to the the nitty gritty. When it comes down to that game against Italy, where you actually want a bit of gnarl and a bit of nastiness, and you want five forwards to take it up and go, do you know what, son? You're fucking having this. When you need those players to stand up, yeah, and you've te- you've just spent ten years taking all the passion out of the game. There's no passion left. There. There's no buttons to press. There's nothing there that says, do you know what you're you're. Uh, you know, you've heard the, the 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 Phil Bennett speech about you know they've closed our minds and all of this kind of stuff. There's none of that there. There's no buttons that we can press on those players now to get them up a notch on that game, and that's what we're missing by him not being at games, by not being involved in the regions, by not being there on a day-to-day basis, and you know he's. He'll have a, a hard time of it on, on Scrum 5, and then he fucks off home to New Zealand for six months. And he'll come back right. for the for the, okay, the then, so, and then he'll, then he'll pick it up again. So to the original question then, should the WRU have accepted Gatlin's resignation? If he was Abby Tyranny now, and Gatlin comes to you and say, I'm handing in my resignation, what would you do? No, of you course know. you wouldn't. You'd be stupid too. It's... Like Harley said, there's no one else to get in. Who are you going to do? You're going to promote from with it. Who are your options? Rich Dwiffin, fuck me. Um, Rob Howley, it's not 2013. Uh, Jonathan Humphreys, <laughs> God no. Uh, is Scott Johnson still around? I don't know. Like, the, the only other names I've seen banded about, right? Steve Tandy. And the last time Steve Tandy comes to a Welsh team, he, he had a punch up with Dan Bigger and Brendan Leonard and had a revolt against him. Um, I love Steve Tandy, right? He's far better suited as a defence coach, right? You're not getting Sean Edwards back. And quite frankly, I think his reputation is tarnished a bit now after Francis, you know? Um, Jamie Joseph is the other one. He's got a job at the minute. He's DOR of the Highlanders on a fat contract with the NZIU. He ain't going anywhere. Who else are you going to get in? Like, Richard Wiggles... Honestly, there's... 
for the what what it ended up being, it'd be a hipster's choice. The casual well, the casual rugby fan, the Six Nations fan, won't know and will write off instantly. Yeah. Right? And that, and if that, and if that person came in right and said and and was like, "We're not going to win the Six Nations this year. We're very much in a transition year. This is not my squad." Then the the, the fans return, right? Gatlin was very fortuitous in that two thousand eight Grand Slam, right? He inherited, let's be fair, an Osprey squad that was Galactico, you know, thirteen Ospreys at the top of their game that essentially won him the Grand Slam. Or started off that process of beating England away, right? And then, of course, the the course the fans are good. People forget that we were shit the next year. We were crap until twenty twelve, really. Well, we had a good twenty eleven World Cup. We weren't great, mm. you know. Yeah, we forget that a bit. There was still four years between two thousand eight and twenty twelve. And yeah. then 2012, 2013 happened. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll give you that. 2015, good World Cup. And then yeah. 2019, like, there, there's still plenty. But the, the casual rugby fan is going to forget that because Gatland is so established and won the Grand Slam on his first got Eddie Jones, right? He got a bit of stick towards the end, still won the Grand Slam first year in England, right? Mm-hmm. Still a good coach. There is no one currently in world rugby that is without a job and be affordable. Like Harley said, who are you going to do? Promote Toby Booth, right? God, he would. That's not the. That's not the type of job Toby Booth would want. They went over it some blood and mud, right? You're not gonna. You're not yeah. gonna get Di Flanagan. You're not gonna get Di Young. You're not gonna get Dwayne Peel or whoever it is, Albert Vanderberger, who was a Scarlet forward coach. Like, there, there is no one, right? So you'd be stupid, and you'd be paying off an absurd, absurd amount of money to get land. Over a stupid life cycle, it's just as much as I don't agree with Gatlin's tactics or his coaching staff or his haircut, right? It, it, he's not worth getting rid of. It, it, it's not worth it. I, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. But I just think I'd be interested to know what Abby Tyranny thought about Gatlin making those comments because mm. I read an article today. It's a really good opinion piece from Ben James in Wales Online, and he wrote that in a way now Gatlin is undermined. Abby Tierney's authority a little bit by making that conversation public. And I just don't like some of the stuff that Gatland have said since he's come back to us. Now, I am supportive of Gatland. I don't hate Gatland, as one particular person on Twitter said. I am oh, genuinely you supportive of him. <laughs> no, I, I genuinely am. But I have to say, I'm not happy with some of the stuff he said in the media, you know, yeah. throwing Alex Mann under the bus like that, blaming the regions. Mm-hmm. For a losing environment, you know, he's blamed the region, saying they're not winning games and criticizing their facilities. Well, it's ironic now, isn't it? Because they're coming from a losing environment, the regional place, into another losing environment. Gatlin has created now a losing environment. You know, I do think he needs to show a little bit more tact and responsibility. But like I said, he's very clever. He is mm-hmm. controlling the narrative. But, you know, I am supportive of Gatlin. But is he above scrutiny? Absolutely not. And I think we can question some of the stuff he's been saying in the media and question his select his selections throughout this tournament. He hasn't mm. got it right. He simply no. hasn't. It, so if I was Abby T, it, it, it's easy to talk in hindsight. I think he caught her off guard, in all yeah. honesty, at the end of that. And when you're head honcho, the last thing you want to do is undermine the people that are around you. And somebody says, do you want me to resign? You go, what? If you'd have turned around and said, "Come and see me on Monday," we'll talk about it on Monday. That shifts the power back, yeah. And it's like, right, okay, I'm not going to give you an answer now. We'll we need to do a review, and then I'll tell you if I want you. If he resigns, there, there's there's no payout. Yeah, you there's resign. No that's well, no. If he resigns, that's his option to break his contract. Yeah, I suppose it's, it, I, I'd be very surprised if anything was written into a contract that says if you decide to resign, you'll get uh, a severance pay. Yeah, severance pay tends to be we don't want you here anymore. So here's a wadge of cash now, fuck off. But if it was all WRU, though, that sounds exactly the sort yeah, of thing you, they write into a contract. It could, it could be written on the back of a fag packet, couldn't it? Um, but yeah, you're right, Jane. It's, it's, it's power games. That's where yeah. it is. It's it's power games, and 
the one thing we don't need right now is another revisit of the late 80s, early 90s. I think we, we don't need that. We, we don't need to have who's in charge and who's got the biggest balls. It just won't do anybody any good and it'll take far too long to get out the other side of it. So, yeah, in hindsight, you'd have said, come and see me Monday, but I think he caught her off guard. But I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like what don't like the tone of this particular coaching spell, if you like. So, well, you all need to work together, don't we? Everybody yeah. needs to be on the same page. I just think some of the stuff that Gatlin has said hasn't helped. But also, as well, at what point does the Welsh rugby public, particularly, you know, the Fairweather fans, we know what they're like, when does their patience begin to run out with Gatlin? Because at the moment, he's got a bit of time. Like I said, he's controlling the narrative. You say we're a young team. There are people out there who are very supportive of Gatland. But if we keep losing like this, at what point does the patient start to wear thin of the Welsh rugby public? That's my question. And I just wonder, will Gatland get to the next World Cup? Will there come a point where the WRU have to say, OK, we we need to start doing something about this now? Um, I'm just interested to see at what point did the Welsh rugby public start to turn on Gatland? Because it hasn't quite happened yet. There's hmm. been criticism of him, but when that Welsh rugby public starts to turn and the interest yeah. dies and the attendances start to fall off, that'll be very interesting. That'll really test the WRU's resolve, won't it? And I think that's that's when it hits, the, the, when yeah. they can't sell tickets for Six Nations. When yeah. Wales, New Zealand in the uh, Autumn Internationals, well, this will be the last year we have Autumn Internationals, won't it? It, it all changes next year, doesn't it? So... um. You know, when you get to the Autumn Internationals and you can't sell out the Autumn Internationals, then, and ultimately, that's the way the professional game is. Money talks. So that's mm. where we are. Right. Yeah. Is there anything else in that Wales Italy game or the fall? I think we'll, we'll, we'll get to the end of the season. We'll have to do a couple of sessions on what's wrong with Welsh rugby at the end of the no, season. Um, but let's go from there. Not necessarily Wales Italy, but who do you think? Over the six nations, who do you think Wales' best player is and who do you think the most underrated player has been? So, right, I, I think in terms of best, the flat out best, has been Tommy Raphael. Um, yeah. mm. I, I, I don't think he's put, and, and second to that would be Aaron Wainwright. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that. It's a toss up between those two, Rafael and Wainwright. Yeah. I think, but I just think Wainwright, uh, sorry, Rafael's just been that bit more consistent in his in his specialist area, especially. And I think underrated, yeah. I, I I do think Gareth Thomas. He, 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 he came in late, and he's just he, he's been his effort levels, his work rate. It's just ridiculous. He was Wales' top carrier on the weekend. Mm. You know, and the tackles he puts in, you know, our scrum's not been great, but that's not been down to him. Like, you try going over his Weenie Antonio, you know. Again, that was but just a sheer weight thing. I, I think I think he's been Wales' most underrated performer by far. Go on, Jamie. Um, um, I'd say, just oh, that like, two player, I'd say he can win it. I, I know his last game and so in a half, I'd say he's been a bit a bit iffy, but I thought he came to international rugby in the man of I'd like to add that Elliot D to best Wales players. I know people have had issues, like have issues with his coverage, but I mean, that's not all, again, similar to Gareth Thomas, that's not all him. But I think for me, the mark, the make, the mark of how important he is to Wales is just how bad things go when he's not on the pitch. We lose a carry track, we lose a jack, we lose someone who can slow down ball. I know Rafael's been brilliant at it, but he can't do it on his own. You know, the lineup goes wonky. I mean, I thought Evan, I mean, admittedly, Evan Lloyd um, on Saturday, I thought did quite a well in the second cap in the lineup. I don't think he was asked to do too much, to be fair. But yeah, I thought he, he had a really good tournament. Rio Dyer, I think, as well, probably under like, He's been getting a lot of shit I've seen on social medias, and frankly, it's undeserved. I think he's been brilliant. I think he's so much better than he was this time last year. You know, he's actually, you know, he's running with a bit more, you know, some of his carries against France were getting us across the game line because he was just, you know, forces mass times acceleration. He hasn't quite got the mass, but he's sure as fucking hell has acceleration. And that's, that's what's been getting us in and punch. You know, Jiffy spent the whole of the game 
moaning about, oh, no one's accelerating to contact, but you give the ball to Darwin and it goes through. I mean, that goes to one of my other problems with the Bell squad. Whenever we did make a line break, no one was there. You'd have real Dyer and Thomas Williams make a line break, and then there was no one. And then we got turned over, and then we were back down. Oh, that's by the by. Um, yeah, I thought. Yeah, I'd say. I say again, I think, yeah, Raphael, Raphael Wainwright, Elliot D, probably the, the best three in the tournament. Lee, me. other than George, sure. here and asked for for me, I'd, I'd I'd go with Wainwright as being my outstanding player for for the Six Nations, just because you know for a number eight, all right, he's not the, the the bulky ball carrier, but what he does with his feet and with his hands, he 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 does. I, I'd say if you put him up there against Falatau, he more than holds his own. So I think we found our replacement for Firetown. Um, I would like to see a bigger, bulky runner either side of him, but I think he's, uh, I think he's been superb. I don't think he's put a foot wrong, even with that hair and moustache. I think the the only thing he's put wrong is that moustache, if I'm honest. But other than that, oh, the moustache is great. Oh, I don't know. It's just with that hair, that mop of hair, it just looks weird. Anyway, but also I wouldn't tell him in in person. I would. I no. I'd I'd say James said <laughs> that, and then I'd run. He folds like an IKEA furniture. <laughs> so, um, underrated, uh, God, uh, I, yeah, I say Alan, uh, Alex Mann just because he's so small for for the position that he needs to play. He's so small; he's more than than held his own. Um, he hasn't dominated anybody, but yeah, he's another two years, and yeah, he'll he'll absolutely be there. Um. In all honesty, you know nobody in in that whole Six Nations can put their hand up and say, you know, I've had a fantastic Six Nations. That everyone's had an off game, and I think that's been the issue. We've had too many. You can cope with maybe one, maybe two of your key players having off days, but when five or six of them are having off days, it's it's just not going to go well. So, yeah, they might too, Jamie. Yeah, I think best player, I think it's a toss of a coin between Rafael and Wayne Wright. You know, I, I think both have been really, really good. Um, yeah, I agree with Harley. I think most underrated Elliot D. Um, I, I, he never lets Wales down, whether he's on the bench, whether he starts. I think he's been really good throughout this tournament and it's been nice to see him starting games. Yes, he doesn't have the bulk of Ryan Elias, I get that, but he always hits his targets. Whatever anyone says about Elliot D, he always hits his targets. The line out always functions well when he starts. So and he does the spinny thing. And he, he does the spinny thing, thing on his finger. It's yeah. very clever. It's very good. <laughs> I like the spinny. <laughs> Ryan Elias was like a few to do the spinny thing and just drop the ball, I think. Absolutely. It's too much brain power. In terms of most... In, well, I, I'm making this up now because this just yeah. wasn't the question. I'd uh, say uh, Real Dyer is Wales's most improved player. Because I think he's really come on leaps and bounds now in this tournament. And look, don't get me wrong. Yes, there were some defensive lapses on the weekend. You can't be called out defence. But that boy works his socks off. You all know that. He is so, so good now, Rio. And he's getting better and better. He has established himself as a test match winger. And I'm really pleased to see that. So, um, yeah, those would be my choices. But also a special mention for Cam Winnett. He, he wasn't very good against fans. I thought he was nervy. But... I think he's got a lot of potential and he's going to get better and better. And yeah, Lee is for Alex, man. He is too lightweight at this level. Gatland is right. He needs to put on, <laughs> you know, some more yeah. weight and add a bit of bulk. But, you know, he's been really, really impressive as these. So, um, mm. yeah, they, they were yeah, positives to come out of this season. tournament. Mm. Yeah, exactly as well. It'll take time. But they have been put some positive individual performances in this mm. tournament, at least. Okay. Let's one, one last one last one. Try okay. what, what's everyone's favorite Wales try of the tournament? Oh, For me, I'm gonna go with the, even though it almost wasn't and he did the wrong thing, but he scored. I thought the Joe Roberts win against France was my absolute favorite. Okay, I'm He's gonna agree. With that one, though. Yeah, I'm gonna agree. He, with always it. Yeah, <laughs> he always butchered it. Yeah, he always butchered the line out, didn't he? I can't remember. Awful lap. I can't go. I can't remember them through my head and go. Okay, which one was which? So yeah, I'll just agree with Harley. I, I I'm like... going to say Alex Mann for England mm. when Thomas Williams yeah. made that break. That was my favourite. Cool. Uh, I like the Osprey's top try score. Missed the penalty try. England. 
um, with agent Ethan Roots uh, conceding the yellow card uh, so that Wales could score. He did his best, bless him, but even, you know, Wales were so bad, we fucked. I like that yeah. Graveham all a lot, though. No, but seriously, I think that Alex Mann trade is England. He just yeah. didn't see it coming at all. Um, and, yeah, he has surprised me. I, I still stand by my comments. I said to Harvey at the start of the season, he needs, for me, a season at regional level. <laughs> um, but, look, I'm glad he's got his caps. You know, there's not many Aberdeer he's boys. Well, he's the best six in, in the regions at the moment, other than when they for future plays at six. Yes. And and I don't think we Mainly can persuade him. Because all him. the Osprey Sixers keep getting yeah. injured. Right. Gents, we're going to have to leave the Six Nations there for another year. But like I say, we'll come back to, uh, uh, at the end of the season, we'll come back and do a uh, a full deep dive, uh, as is a fashionable term now, into where Welsh rugby is. So um, we're going to have to um, quickly rip through this in terms of URC is back. This weekend, uh, we have four games. We've got Glasgow against Cardiff. We've got Ospreys against Munster. We've got Scarlet against Benetton. And we've got Dragons against the Bulls. So, uh, we'll get what we'll do is you review your own game and then give me your predictions for your own game and everything else. Okay? So, Harley, your assessment of Glasgow versus Cardiff and your predictions, if you will, please. So, uh, uh, let's be fair, Glasgow are probably going to get a fair few players back from the Scotland squad. Cardiff will probably get, if we're lucky, Teddy Williams and Seb Davis, if they haven't been fucked in training. Uh, it's going to be fucking awful. It's one of the teams going for the going for the title against one of the teams trying to not be in the bottom four. I can't see anything. like I'm being very optimistic when I say Glasgow by 15. Glasgow by 15. Oh, keep Koki. And Osprey's Munster prediction. Uh, so no, 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 no. You can do your review of that. I'm just going Harley because uh, oh, normally, so, uh, yeah, Glasgow, normally uh, Harley Osprey's fills Munster. all of his in because he's a good boy, but he forgot his laptop this week, so he couldn't fill them all in. So he's going to have to do them now. So Osprey's Munster, just your just your prediction. Don't give me the whole game thing. Just give me your prediction. Oh, Munster by three. Munster by three. Oh. Okay, and Scarlet's Benetton. Is it Scarlet's home game? Scarlet's at home. Oh, Benetton by one then. <laughs> okay, and Dragons Bulls. Dragons are at home. Uh, Bulls by twelve. Bulls by twelve. Change much for me. Okay, <laughs> so uh, James Ospreys Munster. Uh, so we do have the press conference was today so we do actually have some news I haven't watched the full thing because it's come out while we've been on air um, so the main things that come out from that I understand that Max Nagy and Hugh sat in the back um, so Osprey is held uh, I went up to Bristol for a, a training session in the week just like Harlequin is in for Cardiff um, and we sort of knew from that that Sutton and Nagy were back um, yeah, it, it, it's going to be a tough one because I haven't seen who Munster are getting back because obviously their players will all be on the piss. So it's fair to say that Peter Armani, um, Crowley, Calvin Nash, maybe Connor Murray won't be at Swans.com on Friday, but they're still champions and they're still champions for a reason. Um, I'm going to go Ospreys by seven. Oosh, I feel oosh. like that's, that's going to change on Wednesday. Actually, it's not because we're reviewing the best Ospreys in Munster game on Wednesday. So I'm going to kind of say by Ospreys by 28 by the end of Wednesday evening. <laughs> okay. So just your predictions in Glasgow, Cardiff. Uh, Glasgow by eight. Glasgow by eight. Oh. Okay, Benetton at Scarlets. Benetton by four. Benetton by four and Bulls at Dragons. Uh, Bulls by nine wickets. Um, <laughs> nine wickets. It's going to be a fucking cricket score. Um, uh, 
Bulls no, I'll go Bulls by sixteen. Bulls by sixteen. Okay. Bulls by sixteen. Okay, Jamie. So you can start with Dragons v Bulls. Yeah, it's a really tough game, isn't it? I remember the last time Bulls came to Ronnie Parade and I could not get over how big their forwards were. They've got a massive... For, when you see them in the flesh as well, see them in the stands, they mm. are huge. Um, they're a lot of people's favourites to win the URC. Um, we really struggled against this scrum. I remember that when they came to Ronnie Parade, our scrum just got taken to the cleaners. We could not cope with the power. And I'm afraid it's going to be a similar story on Saturday night. Now, we do have a lot of injuries. We had 19 players unavailable. I'm hoping now, with the break, that we've got some players back. The injury list may have been slightly so. It'd be really good to have the likes of Harrison Keddy back, Ollie Griffiths, Lloyd Fairbrother, who's been missed in the scrum. But um, it's very difficult to see Dragons getting anything from this um, because I just don't see how they can cope with the power. You know, if we get any parity up front, then maybe, just maybe, we can get a try bonus point, like they did out in Ulster, which was a really good effort. But again, we had no scrum, really, no platform. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a difficult night for the Dragons. Um, in terms of predictions, I said on the Dragons Layer podcast, I predicted Bulls by 14. I think they'll win by at least two scores, but it could be more. But they're going to say Bulls by 14. Bulls by 14. Okay. Uh, let's go up then. So, uh, prediction of Scarlet's Benetton. I go feeling Scarlet's will win this, but I don't know why. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I don't know why, but I just got a feeling they'll edge this one. How many Italian internationals are Benetton going to get back? That's why That's I said the question. Benetton by four, not Benetton by four. Yeah, but then you've got the international quality second choice players. I know, it indeed, mm. but... If Benetton have their internationals back, that's going to strengthen them even more, isn't it? So, um, I still got a feeling Scarts going to win. I'm going to say Scarts by two. Two. Okay. Koki. Uh, Ospreys Munster. Um, I'm going to say Ospreys by five. I think they'll have enough, just enough to get a job done. Okay. Koki. And Cardiff Glasgow. Very tough place to go, Scotston. Um, yeah, Cardiff got a lot of players unavailable of you know, I don't see the likes of Man win it and, and etc. coming back. So I think Glasgow by eight. Okay. So, Far too generous, Jamie. Maybe, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's a tough place to go, Scotstown, isn't it? Very, very uh, difficult. I think it's going to be good goals, at least. It could be, yeah. Okay, so I'll I'll do Scarlet's Bennett and then... Um... Yeah, quite a few players back from injury, apparently. Um, but we'll find out later in the week. Uh, it's everything has been really, really quiet in terms of you know social media and and here's what we're doing and all that kind of stuff. So it's hard to know what's what's been going on. Um, I mean, it's finger in the ear times. It if it clicks, you know, the the, the defence was starting to click in patches. If we string that together for 80 minutes instead of 60, then it'll go well. Um, and the attack will be the attack. You know, we, we, we even when we're getting a paste in, when we get the ball, we can attack. So it's whether that defensive system is starting to twiggle and, and whether we can stop them doing anything. If we can stop them, then I'm comfortable that we'll, we'll put some tries on them um, but it's whether it works or not. So I'm gonna go Scarlet's by one. What a shock! <laughs> Who saw that coming? Uh, so Glasgow, Cardiff. I'm gonna go Glasgow by 10. Uh, I just uh, even with the amount of players that they've got not coming back. Um, no, I think I think you underrate yourself, Harley. I think. You know the the potential is there, and oh, I think watched, growing. Uh, I've watched this play. <laughs> and I've watched Glasgow play. <laughs> no, I think you. I think you. You've got potential to to turn them over. It doesn't take much to to have an off game, but Glasgow have been firing on all cylinders, even without their best players so far this season. So yeah, I think it'd be a, a good one. Uh, Osprey's Munster. See, I think this is going to be the closest game. Uh, uh, of the weekend, I think it, it, it'll go on a penalty either way. Um, so I'm gonna go uh, Ospreys by one on that one. 
And then, yeah, Dragons v Bulls. Yeah, I'm going to struggle to call the Dragons on that one, team. <laughs> even really? Even you trying, do surprise me. <laughs> even trying to wind you up and trying to, 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 to stir it for you. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go Bulls by 15 on that one. I think that's going to be a real difficult night for you. But they say losing bonus point at the end of the season might make all the difference on that. Mm -hmm. Lovely jubbly. Right. Okay. So we will obviously go into the um the games a bit more on our own pod. So Jamie, you've done that already with the Dragons pod. The Dragons Lair is available already for Dragons fans to yep. listen to. So Scarlet's will also be out same time as this one. When are Cardiff recording this week, Carly? Uh we still haven't sorted that out because I can't do Wednesday and Carl and can't do Thursday, and they're the only two nights normally we're available. So uh, this, it, okay. it could be someone we need to find a ringer to come in. Ooh, I'm trying to sort that. Interesting. Out. James might have to put his blue shirt on. He might have to kind of like put it on his little bobble hat and his little. You don't want me on the Cardiff pod because the amount of time I will say the word proud, right? I will get fucking banned. I'll be honest. I'd much rather just record an episode on my own. <laughs> talking, talking to the wall. <laughs> If you want balance, you invite Yestin on, all right? If you want shit in, you invite me on. If I want deep rugby analysis, I'd invite Will Owen on. <laughs> wow, so, stay tuned. <laughs> James, yeah, I, when... he's, he's, I, hear he's, I hear he's coming on another podcast, which is just pure nepotism, you ask me. Yeah, so uh, we're tapping into, I think I can announce this now. I might not be able to, um, but we have Will Owen on the pod on Wednesday. Um so brother of brother of Robbie um for something that's happening on Wednesday that we'll be able to go into a lot more detail about. Um and then hopefully we'll talk about that Munster game as well because it's been oh, it, I've watched it about three times since last week and I'm just absolutely loving it. So if you want like some good Khan Futwali chat. Um but also I've been watching we, we we've been um itching to get back into the proper rugby, especially after the George North episode last week, which is going well. So go check out the George North episode if you want a, if you want a good little tribute to George North that isn't um some poetry. Which the poetry mm. was very good. Mm. But if you want some instead talking about um how bad Pro 14 highlights were back in the day, um then then you can then you can have that instead. Okay. So if if we're still plugging podcasts, uh because everyone kept nagging us to get someone from the Cardiff board on to do a podcast. No, barely anyone wanted to ask any questions about it when we got on board, but please feel free to listen to it. Yeah, David has chat, promised man. to come back on uh -huh. after, the next, um, eight, after the next board meeting to yeah. give us any updates and, on things. Are you recording for the information place? Yeah, I, in about five minutes. So we need to wrap it up. Um, so <laughs> Harley, we, we were going to do the best 15 first names as surnames for, for last. So we started that last Friday and we thought, okay, well, this will go well. This could, this will be quite a good one. And um, by lunchtime, we had a Welsh one and one for each of the regions as well, uh, which uh, Jamie the Dragons one was supplied by the Dragons. But I, I did have to pull them up because they had Jamie Roberts there with an S on the end and that. that I know. You know, so... Yeah. The, you well, know, fair but... play for them to get involved. They didn't have to, did they? For the official media account for getting involved, fair play. Yeah, yeah. that's the slow day stuff to be <laughs> Yeah, just have a bell, just a report <laughs> on media. I mean, so. really, really the fucking, yeah, the admin was playing snake in the office and was just desperate for someone to come through, to be honest. Probably. So, <laughs> Harley, what, what will this Friday? It, it, the plan is to kind of you know, announce what that best 15 would have been, but we, we've run out of time. So what would be this Friday's uh, best 15, mate? Um, this is one I want people, if they can be asked, to share with their friends who don't support one of the Welsh regions in the year. Because for this one, I'd like you to pick the 15 not in your 15. So 15 players from one of the other 15 teams that you, in the URC. So James can't select Rhys Henry, Jamie Carter, pick me on Brown. I was going to be extra mean and say that put that the player couldn't have ever played for your for your team, but you know, you know, if James is going to pick a, Car uh, a Cardiff player, I'm sure he's going to pick one who's also played for the Ospreys. 
No, I so you couldn't, you couldn't do Tell Sally. No, you can't uh, be selected current, for anyone. Current URC players, so they should be registered as a player for one of these teams currently. Oh, well, Scarlet's a fuck then because yeah. they've got no. <laughs> No yeah, one in Wales. So there's, no Welsh yeah. <laughs> there's no Welsh. Yeah, there's no Welsh players. I probably just to say I'll, I'll have San Costello from from the Scarlets. That's all Joe. Well, to be honest, it'd be Joe Roberts. Let's be honest. I think everyone's Scarlets is Joe Roberts. Can I just make a team from Cardiff and Dragons players? Probably. I don't well, know Cardiff and Dragons. In theory, can make a team just from Cardiff and Dragons players. There are there there are sixteen teams and fifteen players, so one from each team. Yeah, that's that's yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, yeah just so not one, your own. just. One from, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, right. you know, Manning the bot from the Stormers, um, Gezi from Zebra, you know, uh, Mac Hansen from yes, Connor. You can't, you can't just select 15 balls players. You've got to have yeah, like, one, from, be each one from each team. Right, okay. There That's a go. good one. That's a yeah. good one. Yeah. Think about that. Right, okay. Thinking caps on. Gents, thank you very much for this evening. Pleasure as always. Um, no more Six Nations for a while, so we can just get back to... But women's Six Nations is on. Yes. Oh, yeah. But point. We've actually we, we, we're not going to be anywhere near as 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 awful. We're actually quite decent uh, now in the women's Six Nations. So we will cover women's Six Nations next week, as we did last year. Um, we had a couple of women guests on last year, didn't we? We had um. Uh, bit of Tatiette, I think, joined us, and the yeah, Irish, Irish girl. Oh, whose name I can't remember. Chris, was kind of... it Christy Haney? No, was Chrissy it... Haney. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right, that was yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah. we will do our best on that, gents. And on that note, I shall bid you farewell. Enjoy your rugby. See you next week. All the best. Have a good one. Bye, Bye everybody. listening to the rap podcast we hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed recording it please do rate us and tell your friends that it really helps us to grow and get better we'll be back next week for more of the same and until then enjoy your rugby sports social podcast network hello it is ryan and i was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com i looked over the person sitting next to me and you know what they were doing they were also playing chumba casino coincidence i think not everybody's loving having fun with it chumba casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime anywhere even at thirty thousand feet so sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus that's chumbacasino.com and live the chumba life no purchase necessary btw void were prohibited by law see terms and conditions 18 plus.